Hello everyone, welcome uh, to this evening's BAFTA Guru Live event. My name is Jo Duncan and I'm the Film Programme Manager at the British Council um, and I'm really delighted that you can all join us this evening for our panel on the strategy of shorts. Uh, with big thanks to our uh, session supporters EE, who are supporting all of our film related sessions at Guru Live Digital this year. Uh, before we go any further, I'm just going to fill you in on a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so I just want you all to note that this evening has closed captions as well as a, a live transcript that you can follow along with. So closed captions, uh, they can be turned on via the CC button, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can access a live transcript via the link in the chat box, which um, our colleagues at Gap BAFTA will have provided for you. Um, so the structure of this evening's panel is that um, I'll be chatting with this evening's guests for about 45 minutes. Um, and then after that, we're going to have 15 minutes of uh, questions from you guys in the audience. So if you do have a question, please feel free to send them my way using the Q&A function, which is also at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to do that at any point throughout the evening. And we'll be collecting them as we go. And then at the end, we'll jump in and have a look and, and try to get to as many of them as possible. So that's it with the housekeeping. And now onto the really interesting bit, which is our amazing filmmakers who are joining us for this evening. Um, so I will start with Sarah Bacon, who is a BAFTA nominated producer and her short films have screened at festivals from Sundance to South by Southwest. And they include the BAFTA nominated Ren Boys, uh, directed by Harry Lighton. Uh, as well as Good Thanks You, which was directed by Molly Manning Walker and selected for the 2020 Cannes Critic Week. Uh, Mother, which was directed by Jazz Pitts and Kate Stonehill and which screened at this, year, this year's BFI London Film Festival and AFI Docs. Uh, as well as the film If You Knew, directed by Stroma Cairns, which was nominated for Best Short Film and the BFI London Film Festival and she she at the BFI London Film Festival and Sheffield Doc Fest. Um, and she's currently developing a slate of feature films, which uh, we will definitely be digging into later. So please give a very warm welcome to Soraha. Welcome, Soraha. Um, my next guest is uh, Alex Seabright, who is a writer and uh, director known for her short films, including Pregnant Pause, which was funded by Film London and Sky, Sex Ed and Endo, which was a, a Grand Prix nominee at the Clermont Ferrand International Short Film Festival. Uh, she's also directed two episodes of the second series of Netflix's infamous sex education. And she's currently working on her first original television commission called Chloe, which is a six part thriller for BBC One. So please give a very warm welcome to Alice Seabright. Hi Alice. Um, and finally, um, Miriam Raja, uh, who is a BAFTA nominated writer and director and her short films include Tazib and The Third Sorrow, which uh, both of which screened at festivals, including the BFI London Film Festival. Um, and her film Lil Miss Candy was produced uh, by the BBC Four and BFI funded Born Digital Programme. Uh, and her short film Azar was nominated for a BAFTA. So uh, Miriam has also recently directed a uh, second unit on Netflix's also infamous uh, uh, series Top Boy, and she's also currently developing her debut feature. So please give a, a lovely warm welcome to Miriam and give them all some love on the chat function. Hi guys, um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, this is a really exciting panel of filmmaking talent um, and you've all used short film to hone your creative uh, talents and also your industry skills uh, to progress yourselves towards larger scale projects in both film and, and TV. And tonight's panel is all about exploring how to approach short film as a medium um, in what is actually a very saturated market, uh, both online and at festivals. Um, and how to make those really strategic choices with your short film projects to develop both artistically um, and professionally. So you guys have all got such a wealth of experience with, with the medium of short film um, and your careers are really moving in really exciting directions. But I think it would be really cool to start off at the beginning um, and hear a little bit about the first short films that you each made. Um, 
and you can you can take that in whatever way you want, whether it's a, your first short film that you ever made uh, that didn't necessarily see the light of day or the first short film that you made that screened publicly. Um, but it'd be great to hear from each of you, like what, what you what you feel when you look back at that first short film project. What, what do you like about it? What you didn't like and what did it teach you about about storytelling? So. Let's start with Miriam. Miriam, could you uh, unmute yourself and <laughs> Hi. So I guess um, I started making films when I was quite young. I was 14 and I decided to make a horror film with my mum's mini DV cameras. It was mini DV tapes back then. And I, I, I don't know, I guess I, I just understood the tropes of horror and I understood the genre of horror and it felt like something that was, that was uh, I understood how to recreate it. And so I ended up just having fun with my friends making that. But it wasn't until it, like, it got screened at some children's film festival and I got to go to Leeds. So I'm normally based in Slough and to get out of Slough was a treat and got to Leeds and then I got to see the audience sort of react. Um, there was like someone just going, oh, a, a not particularly scary part, but I felt so amazed by that. And I decided at that point, actually, I wanna, I wanna just disturb people. Um, and so that, it was, I think it was seeing a film and made being watched by an audience that really made me go, that's what I want to do. So that it's that connection between the film and the audience for me, that's the most important beyond just wanting to express and make. Um, and then, yeah, so since then, I've just kind of been making shorts at school and with friends and then I, I, I went, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the beginning. That was, that I would still count that as the first ever little film I made that, that began everything for me. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that you, you want to disturb us. I think that's really cool. <laughs> Um, and but also that idea of getting validation from from an audience. So it's not just the kind of the trying things out artistically, but also moving into spaces where you can you can find some response and validation from from the people that you're trying to connect with for your work. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, Miriam, if you could just remute, and then I'll go over to Alice. Alice, um, it would be great to hear a little bit about your your first experience of making a short film and what it feels like looking back at it now. Um, yeah, I mean, I also um, made a really bad short film when I was about 16, I think. Um, it did not get in, I mean, it, it wasn't even, um, it was it was basically roping my two friends into, it was like a silent film in which my two friends, uh, one of them murdered the other for pretty much no reason. And uh, it did, the story didn't quite hang together. Um, but it was it was really fun to make and I remember just having an amazing time doing it and it was also like on a mini DV it was yeah just made for no money and and over a weekend just for fun um, and a lot of the definitely I, I feel like the the way I got hooked was that that way like doing it with friends usually friends acting in it sometimes me acting in it I'd carried on doing that at university always for for no money and just kind of as it there was something about the process I think that I just got really hooked on and really enjoyed um and then yeah and then it was the the first film that I made which that was probably just out of uni I think so I think I was maybe 22 or something um was the first time I made a short film which was same for no money and it had my two friends acting in it but I properly, I remember going, I've just been making these on a whim and I need to think this through now. I'm gonna like, what's, I, I need to kind of write the script properly and plan it out and decide exactly how I'm gonna shoot it rather than just going like, hey, let's let's do this today and just, you know, it, it kind of improvise it. Um, and that was the first time that I felt like I'd made something that actually hung together and that I could share with people. Um, and then that did sort of start, that, that was something like it won a, a virtual media shorts prize and it got a bit of attention that way and that was the first time that I went oh okay this is you know this is something that I can um there's a craft that I'm learning here it's not just something that I'm you know it's not just something that I'm enjoying doing this there's there's a lot to learn here and that was I think the first time that I felt like yeah just excited to to really 
learn everything there was about the process I think yeah well thanks Alice and um, and it's nice to hear also that that kind of mucking around with your mates in a way at the beginning really sort of sowed the seeds for you realizing that actually there was something in it that you wanted to to actually nourish properly and and turn into your craft yeah and I think weirdly you learn a lot doing that as well because then you know so I was editing that stuff myself at, on the university um editing software and that process of doing everything for me yeah. was a huge part of learning filmmaking because you have to do you know you, ha you have to be in it or <laughs> edit it you have to hold the boom you have to be the camera person you have to do all of those different things and so you kind of learn it the whole process from a to z rather than just the director's job which i think yeah is which must make now working on set a lot easier because you have mm. that inherent understanding of how everybody's role builds the big picture brilliant thanks alice so i'm going to go over to saraha now um, so tell us a little bit about your first your first short film experience and, and what you learned from it. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I feel like I've got like three or four different first short experiences. I'm trying to think which one um, is the is the real first one. But the actual first ever short film I made, I was like at university. There was a competition called the Campus Movie Fest, um, and me and my um, my uh, like best friend, at the, um, he was getting into cinematography. He'd like gone to Russia and got this random camera on this like charity gig so came back and we decided let's make a film and it is the worst film that's ever been made and should never ever see the light of day um but because it played this campus movie first it ended up playing like the Odeon Leicester Square which was hilarious so we thought we'd made it big time um and decided being like quite pretentious teenage like young adults leaving university that we'd have to we, we were going to do a an adaptation of a Rudyard Kipling short story um which is what the first um, proper short film we ever did, which weirdly was um, like quite, If I, I think back at it now and it was actually quite like, it was quite interesting how it all came together. So we did a crowdfund. I did it with Helen Simmons, who's a great friend and a really amazing producer now. And we made that together and we both learned hard and fast way, like just how to make a really, I mean, it was just an awful film. It was like, we did like 22 hour days. Like we lost, everything broke. It was so rainy. Um, it was chaos, but like the outcome of that was a film that we were, you know, was something that we made. And then I just kind of got really addicted to it and then just ended up making, made a short film with um, Harry Michelle called um, uh, The Brief History and Untimely Death of George III, The Guinea Pig, um, which, was, which was really fun. And we did that in a studio and suddenly kind of everything that I'd learned from that kind of first short film, which we shot on a DV cam that was just atrocious into the next film, which I learned what a camera was and I learned what it meant to be a producer, even though I never really am sure all the time what that role is. And then suddenly made the short film in, in a proper film studio with like proper cameras and proper crew and realizing what everyone did. And I mean, it still was made for no money, but I think what like Miriam and Alice said, it was when we got, I got an email from London Short Film Festival being like, your film has gone into London Short Film Festival. And I remember getting that email and stopping dead in the street and being like, oh my God, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. It's amazing. And I, I still get really excited every time I get an email from a festival, but that one I remember as being like quite a significant um, change. And that was the bug that's like kept going. It's like, um, and I remember watching that film for the first time in a cinema with my family. It was the like funny shorts program at LS, um, LSFF, the ICA. And that was just, it was amazing. It was so nice to see something you've done um, be on the big screen. So yeah, it's just sort of been like an addiction since then. It's sure, it's definitely true that seeing work on a big screen and having your your friends and family able to see it and knowing that there's a wider public there as well watching it is, is so validating and exciting. Um, so thank you all for sharing those like initial, uh, ventures into the world of short film it would be cool to like I think one thing I hear said so many times on short film panels and people filmmakers talking about their experience of making short films is we made it on a shoestring we didn't have any money we never have any money short films are really bloody hard to make aren't they and there are a lot of hard work there you know you don't there's not much in it financially at the time um what keeps you going back to making a short film? Because you've all made more than one short film. Why do you go back to it? And more, perhaps even more importantly, when do you know when you want to stop making short films? Or have you even decided to stop making short films? Um, so let's go to Alice. 
for that to start us off. Thanks, Alice. Uh, I would say you keep making short films because you don't have the option to make anything else. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, you know, and and because you learn, like because. It, like you start by making a short film because you can't, it's not like you can start by making a feature. I mean, some people do actually, but um, yeah, I feel like it makes sense as a starting place. I definitely kept going. A lot of the time I find, found that like what the thing that I was thinking about for the next short film was something new I wanted to try. So it was like, I've done something that's really um, like my first, not the, really bad first short film but the first short film that made sense was a silent like there was no dialogue in it and then send it so then I was like the next thing I want to do actually I just feel like I want to do something really talky because I love those sorts of films and I, I, I just want a, one scene in a room and then I wanted to do something or, or it's sometimes it's subject matter it's like I really want to tell a story about this it's like it, that's what brings you on to the next one but I think ultimately um, you move on when you get an opportunity to move on. Um, and, you know, uh, you, it's always like, what can you do? I always feel like with filmmaking, you have to go, what, what is available to me now? And if what's available to you now is make a short film for no money with a camera that you borrow off someone with your friends acting in it, then you do that. And if it's what's available to you is, you know, a budget and proper cast and proper crew, then you do that. And at some point, hopefully someone says here's an opportunity to to make something longer for more um but but ultimately you look at what's in front of you and you start from that i think so how you you made a film in lockdown so i guess that speaks <laughs> to um, alice's point about making making stuff of what's available to you at the time yeah no I, i'm i'm working with the director and we have a short film that we were due to shoot in march and then we were due to shoot in november and we decided to push it to the new year and it's the last short I'm hoping to do. Um, but with the director I'm so excited by and he was so itching to make something. So he made a follow up to his previous short Memoirs of the Giza, um, which is really great. And I check out, I was everyone. Um, he's made a follow up called Memoirs of a Freezer, which is a stop motion animation about disgruntled freezer. Um, and it's actually, it was really fun because like my slate is not, comedy I don't tend to make stuff that's like deliberately funny I just tend to make stuff that happens to be funny but it's not really f funny at all so it was quite nice to do a kind of more really simple you know narrative um monologue of a disgruntled freezer um when we got um Edward Rowe who's in bait to do the kind of voice of the freezer which was pretty amazing but it was all yeah it was just done in lockdown for for absolutely nothing like completely nothing um I think all we did we just sort of sourced um, images from 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 uh, from reverse image search on Google. So found one fridge and it linked to another fridge and ended up in a freezer. And so yeah, it was quite. But but I mean, it's interesting what you say. I think like I've done shorts. I just did one. Um, just wrapped one with BBC Films um, like ten days ago. Um, and you know that was a really great project. We had a huge cast. Um, not a huge cast, sorry, a big crew, a big team, um, lots of support behind it, lots of kind of um, gimmicks and exciting bits and bobs. And then, and that's amazing. And I love that. But I also did a short called um, Sparrow, which was sort of me, the DP and the director and two actors. And we went, um, we had some money from a death metal music video band and they wanted a music video. And we just said, cool, we'll do a music video. But we did a short film for them instead, which was just improvised over a weekend in Skegness in a caravan park and it did really well and it got the director a agent and did kind of what it needed to do for them so you know you can kind of make stuff on nothing if you're clever with the resources all you need is like a really good idea um, and something really simple always that's my sort of my motto just a simple concept goes a long way than trying to do I think often in shorts people think that they need to kind of do I don't know like a multi-location multi universe multi-cast multi-decade project but actually if you just all my shorts have really just been over a day like a story that's set in one day in one moment in one conversation or in one like um something yeah something really felt in the moment and they've always for me felt the most successful so that's a tangent but essentially I yeah I, I find that question of like you can make shorts or nothing if you're really smart about what you're trying to say in that kind of brief um, time you've got with with the camera don't overspread yourself 
a very useful tangent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Miriam, do you have any thoughts on, on you know, why, why it's good to, or useful to return to short filmmaking and, and to keep going with it? Yeah, I guess um, it, for me, it was, it was definitely to keep practicing my craft and uh, all of the shorts I've made, I've written and they have all been sort of exploring situations, you know, characters within contained situations rather than very plot driven stories. Um, and so th in that sense, they've been quite self-contained, quite domestic. Um, and also I was making shorts through uni. So I went to Arts University Bournemouth to study film. So I made shorts there. I then made shorts after uni. And then I went to NFTS and made shorts there. But it was when I got to my graduation film, Azar, that that was the first time I decided to do something that was basically a period film set in India and with quite a, a big, big theme I was trying to talk about in lots of layers. And that's when I began to realize I'm, I'm sort of ready to move on from shorts basically and that uh, I want to explore stories that deserve well that require more space on screen now um, and so as I became my last short and that decision I made quite consciously actually I like Little Miss Candy was the last short but that was a that became sort of an, an exercise in wanting to try something new so I used that short to try something new kind of like what Alice was saying with um wanting to just you know try and that one was definitely for me to try visually something i had never done before um but then it, it was very conscious i was i was still you know kind of thinking oh should i do another short should i do another short but i decided to not um and so now i'm focusing on right it, it's tough because then you don't i haven't for example i'm back on set now but last time i was on set was a year and a half ago so you do limit how much you're flexing your directing muscles in a sense, if you're not doing shorts in between. But essentially it's just to answer your second half about when to decide when to stop doing shorts. And for me, it became very conscious, like, okay, now I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna work towards the feature. Brilliant, thank you, Miriam. So Soraha, we're going to zoom in on your work for a little bit, um, and we'll do that with each of the with each of the filmmakers. Um, so you've you've got an amazing success rate in terms of the the films you produce, playing at major international festivals, and also being nominated for major awards. Um, so as a producer, it'd be really interesting to hear you talk about a little bit about what what it is that draws you to the projects that you say yes to and what you're looking for um, in terms of your collaborative team. Um, and, and, and crucially, what's more interesting to you, the filmmaker or the project that the filmmaker presents to you? Um, so just a little flurry yeah. of questions there. No, good questions. Um, I think for me, the most important thing is that like, I think, I mean, working with filmmakers is like a full-time relationship. So you just have to have a connection with them that is different to any connection you have with someone else. You have to have like a freedom of honesty and of collaboration. And I love kind of working really closely with the writers and directors that I work with. Um, I think in terms of the projects that speak to me, I think I like projects that say something. So I'm quite like agnostic in terms, I like, I, I don't, I love documentaries as much as I love fiction. I love kind of films that sort of blur the lines between the two. Um, I love um, kind of working on projects that really have a voice and sort of say something politically or say something socially. So a lot of the work I've done has centered on the experience of women or the experience of, um, of the LGBT community, um, which is where I found quite a lot of my collaborators through the kind of BFI, um, Flair Film Festival, which is kind of where a lot of the shorts that I've done have come, collaborations have come from. So Pompeii um, was one of the recent projects, which was a co-direction co between three amazing directors, Harry um, Lighton, Marco Alessi and Matthew Jacobs Morgan. And we all met at, um, at BFI Flair and decided to make a film together that we, you know, we shot on iPhones over like six months and it was just so much fun. Um, 
So I think it's both. I think I would find it really difficult to work with directors that aren't kind of like, I, I think it's it, for me, it's really important that we have a really open relationship where I can sort of not feel afraid. Just I, I'm quite pushy with, with my notes and my kind of, I like to push directors to kind of get the most out of them. So I think having a really honest relationship is, is really important there. But I also, yeah, I don't like the idea of a director. I, I like working with directors who appreciate the producer and what they have to say and it being like a collaborative um, evolving relationship. Um, but I don't think there's any kind of real rules to what I do. Like I never thought I would want to do a comedy about a pregnant woman who robs little chefs, but here I'm, that's what I'm doing next. So, you know, it's like, wow. there's no, yeah, I know, fun, right? Um, yeah. And I thought I'd always, I remember at the beginning, I was like, I only want to do um, queer films. That's all I'm interested in, but that's actually evolved so much. And I think I think it really just totally depends on on the filmmaker and what they're wanting to say, but like, I think it's just about the voice of the filmmaker. And if I feel like I can support that voice and what they're trying to say, and if what I think they're trying to say is interesting and the world needs to hear it, then that's the kind of film I'm excited by. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you've got you've got some features in development at the moment, um, which I think you alluded to just then. Um, but so you've got you've worked with directors you're working with directors whose shorts you've already produced um and with directors whose previous shorts have also been very successful on the festival circuit etc mm -hmm. um, how valuable have you found the success of those short films in terms of from a producer's role securing yeah. funding for feature projects yeah i mean hugely important um so yeah there's two filmmakers i'm working with at the moment who i haven't um, I haven't done shorts with, but their shorts have done independently incredibly, they've been both incredibly successful. So one was recently BAFTA winning, BAFTA Cymru winning, another one just won Holly, um, Holly Shorts. So like both of those directors have their shorts that have done exceptionally well. And that piece of work is such a strong and valuable tool for me as a producer to kind of buy into their sense of tone and their sense of like um, creativity and what they want to say. It's like such a valuable piece of work for me. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really important. It's really hard, especially in the kind of British independent film scene, like shorts are your biggest worth, like they are your biggest currency as a director. Um, it's quite hard to just kind of jump in at the deep end and try and get like a feature made in the, the UK, um, just off, off the back of like, hey, I'm a director, like you really need to have something to show for it. Um, and shorts are so helpful in being able to do that. So that's been like, yeah, really critical to the success of of that relationship um but also working on with this um short film i just did with the director um it was great because i now totally understand her kind of voice as a director when we're moving towards building a feature together and it feels like it was a really valuable lesson i don't think it's necessary to have to have done a short with the director to do a feature with them i think it's a bonus it gives you a chance to kind of flex both of you figure out that relationship because it is ultimately like dating someone like you produce a director relationship it's like going on lots and lots of dates and realizing if you're compatible and if you're not then it's okay like not everyone has to fall in love <laughs> um but yeah that's that to me is like part and parcel of the the short film building short films with directors if you can I love that analogy and I feel like somewhere someone's listening and already developing an app for this <laughs> to set up producers and directors. Um, thank you, Soraha. I'm going to move over. There we go. Oh, sorry, I muted myself. I'm going to move over to Alice now um, and dive in, into your work in a little bit more in detail. So, Alice, let's talk about your short film Endo. Um, when you were making this short, where was where was this short on your on your sort of timeline? Was it your second short or no? And is actually the last short I made. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, we when you were making this this short, and were you conscious of it being um, a bit of a step up in terms of trying things out and looking to try new things? Was that something that you were conscious of before you started the project? Um, um, I was definitely like like Miriam was saying earlier with her um, uh, last short, I had kind of not planned really to make another short. Um, and I, I write, have, 
I've written most of my shorts, but I didn't write Endo. It was sent to me um, by a really good friend of mine who is a brilliant writer who I've known for a few years. And I sort of always admired her writing and always wanted to work with her. And she has the film Endo is called, it's about um, a woman living with endometriosis and she has endometriosis herself. And I'd heard a lot about it just as her friend. And she sent me this showing the script in the really, really early stages of development um, and, and basically said, is this something you want to work on together? Um, and I just, yeah, it was one of those, where I was like, I don't want to make another short, but I do want to make this <laughs> um, because it just really spoke to me. There was something really like raw about the way that it expressed the kind of, like the, the anger and the frustration and the pain basically of, of, of her life really um living with endo and so it just yeah it just kind of jumped out at me and I was like I really want to want to make this it was also incidentally like as a byproduct it happened to be a step up in terms of the budget you know we got we managed to get more we we did a kickstart of some of it and then we managed to get some further funding from other sources which meant that it was in the end probably the highest budget I've had on a short film um and uh and that was yeah that was also I think the subject matter that we were able to find people who kind of really cared about it and wanted to support that um and it was also I, I think I was drawn to it because of the subject matter and the writing and the voice and all of that stuff but I I, I think I probably was also drawn to it for kind of craft reasons that there was a lot of you know it's a multi-timeline and um, there was a lot of like really interesting visual imagery imagery that I was excited to play with and stuff like that. So there was, it was kind of on both levels. I was excited by what it was saying, what it was doing and the emotion of it. But I was also excited by the challenges of the actual, you know, craft of making it. Um, was it a very different experience for you? Because this, you said it was the first short film you made where you hadn't written and directed it. Was it a very different experience for you in terms of craft working on a film that you hadn't written? It was quite different um, and I loved it. I didn't, I, it didn't make me go, like it, it was very different, but I, I really appreciated it. I mean, I think, um, I don't know if this is because I'm also a writer or I would just be like this anyway, but I definitely, it was very collaborative. And I found that like, I, I had so many conversations with Elaine about every single line and every single moment and trying to get to the bottom. Like there was no moment in that, in it that I hadn't interrogated to death with with her and and felt like I understood almost as as if I I'd written it because I think that's what I really realized I guess is that when when it's your own script there's a sort of there's basically so much work that's already been done which is that you already know what each beat means and you do have to do a bit you do actually at some point have to take your writer's hat on and put your director's hat on and go let me let me think about what you know I know what the beat means as a writer but how do I tell it as a director but I think you know when it's not your script you're you, you just have to make sure that you understand it as closely as you would as you know if you'd written it and and that is a really quite different process but I I enjoyed it and I I'm quite a collaborative person anyway even when it is my script so I think for me it was another extension of that it's like like the DP relationship or like the relationship with the production designer it's like well this is this is a further relationship that's part of like filmmaking so collaborative that the idea that the director is their film more than anyone else's is silly anyway um so you know I think I, I enjoyed that yeah I enjoyed it um and let's let's dive into a little bit of, about your um your moving into tv um so your work on Netflix, uh, Netflix series Sex Education, and also your upcoming BBC commission. Um, where do you think your shorts were a useful gateway into that work? Um, and has the kind of transition been easy to manage? Uh, uh, what skills have you taken from the short film craft into television? And and then also perhaps a little bit about how your short films might have acted as calling cards for commissioners. Um, how did you use them to um, kind of to garner that work, if at all? Yeah, okay, I'm going to try and remember all of those questions. The first one was, uh, oh yeah, if the shorts got got me the, yeah, 100%, it's the only way you, you get 
work really is through the films that you've made um so definitely you know I I had been I interviewed a lot for TV work before I got the sex education job it was you know it wasn't like the first thing out the gate and um but always the people you meet they they're meeting you because they've seen your films um and then you it's it's an interview like anything else so you're pitching your ability to do it um uh and um yeah and then what was the second question <laughs> um so let me just track back to what i've asked you um sorry my fault i asked way too many questions in one go um so the shorts is a calling card which which you, you've yeah definitely. Um, maybe talk a little bit more about this kind of the way that you how would you go about kind of sharing your films in that way with a commissioner for netflix or for BBC? Um, what way are you watching i'd say the first step is getting an agent um so and that's a really difficult step because there's a lot of really talented people out there and there's you know agents have their books are quite um uh quite full usually but um you know it's a combination there's sort of like two approaches that you can do one is just to keep making stuff and hope that it lands on people's desk and it does like if it gets you know if you have stuff getting into festivals and um you're making more and more stuff and it kind of adds up to a picture p agents really do they're on the lookout um and then the other approach is just trying to you know if you're within the film industry and meeting people and and you know like i i worked as an assistant um for different companies for a while before i was um you know kind of branching out to to be a writer director and so that helped that i had people that who could pass my stuff on or who could recommend my stuff and that is that is really helpful if you can do that and then the agent is the person who will get you in front of production companies so they'll send your work out and then you do either like generals which is you just meet producers um who have seen your stuff and uh, so i i also had my shorts and then i had my scripts so like my i had tv and feature scripts that were being read so i was kind of being seen as as both um and then and then they'll either think of you <laughs> or be suggested um by your agent when a specific job comes up and then and then you interview a lot usually <laughs> um and then hopefully you get something but it's it's it, there's a few steps to, in the process yeah thanks Alice. and then i've remembered another question it yeah, was, sorry um, what was how what did i learn from short film mil, filmmaking yeah. that um i took into television that's quite interesting actually because i before i started on the show i was like how how it, what's this going to be like do I know what I'm doing do I not know what I'm doing like I was quite nervous and quite like intrigued as well to just see what it would be like um and on the one hand I did I was like quite relieved that I'd been I'd made a lot of films in the run-up to, to to going on set so I did feel quite practiced and I was quite relieved to feel like it is it's the same it's there's no there's no like magical new thing that happens when you get to a, a project like that um you know, it's basically like the same processes that you're doing on a short film. Um, and that was nice. Um, and on, on, on the one hand, in a weird way, it's easier because there's more money, there's, you don't have to do the catering as well as the directing. Like, you know, you literally have one job to do. And that was like such a relief that I could like <laughs> get some sleep and like not be, you know, managing like a million different plates. And then the one thing that I did find was really different, and this is kind of dumb, but it's it's basic, but but kind of obvious, is just the length. Um, that with a short film, especially if it's a short film that you've written, you know, you've got 15 pages or 20 pages that you hold in your mind so naturally because just of the length of it, and presumably because you know it, you know, you just know it so well, and you don't have to make a particular effort to to hold it. Whereas as soon as you're moving on to, so I was doing two episodes, which is like 50, it's like an, it's, it's like a feature, it, yeah, it's basically a feature film's worth. Suddenly you have to, and, and you know, I was given, I didn't write the scripts and I was given the scripts a few weeks before filming, like you get, you know, a few weeks prep. Um, so basically there's a huge amount of work that just has to be put into like, no, like so much homework basically that you have to, know everything inside out and in order to do that it just requires a lot more active conscious 
you know, prep, breaking down, like reading the script over and over and over again. And even then, you know, you like, I, I would have to prep, like, I'd prep every weekend for the coming week because, and, and every morning you're going over going like, okay, what, what, what are we doing today? Because on a, you know, on a four day shoot, you, you don't need to do that. It's four days. You can remember it, but, but by the time you get to week five or whatever, it's just gone. You're like, what the hell are we doing in week five? And so you have to constantly, um, and so I think that, and, and, and making sure that you're tracking the story and, and, and taking care of it, because that is ultimately your job as the director is to be that guardian of the big picture. I found the length just, that was the biggest challenge, weirdly. On, on a moment to moment basis, it was quite similar. Thanks, Alice. Um, Miriam, you've also transitioned into the TV world uh, with your work on Top Boy. Um, a lot of people make the assumption around, you know, you've got 10 short films under your belt and a lot of people make the assumption with, with short filmmaking that the next step is, is to make start developing your debut feature, but you've obviously gone into TV. Was that something that was strategically planned for you or was it always your goal, I want to make this feature film and you've got a feature film in mind or was it that you were thinking all the time, I'm, TV is where I want to go? Um, I guess I guess growing up, I always thought I was only going to make films. When at, when I when we were younger, we, like Netflix and the way TVs become so much more cinematic, wasn't it? It wasn't like a big sort of plan. Um, I so I, I so what I did on Top Boy last year, or the year before, it was yeah, it was um, it was like a mentee scheme that Netflix had set up. And um, I got contacted, but it came through my agent and they were just like, oh, we're just looking for directors to shadow the main directors of the blocks on the last three apps. Do you want to come in? Would you, you know, do you want to apply and do that? And, um, and Top Boy is so wildly different as a world uh, um, to what I normally do. And I thought, okay, yeah, let's dive in and do that. And um, it was, it was yeah it was it was pretty amazing in how it felt so it didn't feel too vastly different from the work you do on a feature um it, it's the same amount of yeah so i in terms of directing i just thought it was kind of tackling a different part of you as a director um and now i've realized that i want to be developing scripts but that takes so long um to be in development for ages and to not direct would be, um, I think, quite detrimental. So now I'm basically thinking a lot more seriously about wanting to break up script development with jobs on TV that could be, and also you get a chance to work on things that could be quite different to what you normally make. And so, so right now, for example, I am on a Netflix show I don't, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say what it is. I'm just basically directing that now at the moment, but also developing the feature, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it's, that sounds very exciting. I wish you could tell us, but I'm sure we'll, we'll find out soon enough. Um, so I think we've, we've got about 15 minutes left. So now's about the time that we're going to jump over to audience questions. Um, and I, I don't know whether uh okay we're gonna we're gonna have an, an another another question for miriam before we do that because sorry we're not ready to jump over to um audience questions just yet i think after a busy behind the scenes pulling them all together um so let's go back to um let's go back to awards and uh to festivals and the way that they get responded to it um short films get responded to and picked up at festivals and by organizations like BAFTA so Soraha and Miriam you've both had a BAFTA nomination for for short films and you've all won awards for your films at festivals what do you is that something that collectively you guys are thinking about when you are making your films or is it something that you think right we're going to aim for that award or we're going to aim for this when, we, when we're developing the project or is it just you're just solely working on the projects and hoping or if that happens it's great or is it something that you build into your kind of strategy with the work so let's start with Soraha. Um, I think uh, when I started out it was 
um, it def that was definitely, I mean, it still isn't ever a consideration. Like the getting films into festivals is is always such an absolute joy. And like, I, I, I couldn't be more proud that, um, good thanks to you, the latest show I did with um, DMC that Molly, Manny Walker directed, got into Critics Week at Cannes. That was honestly like, no one went into that project thinking that was gonna happen. And when we found out the news, just like a lot of screaming, a lot of cheering and crying and thinking, Wah! and then of course COVID happened and we didn't even get to go and have the can experience, but never mind. Um, but no, you don't, I think, I think if you kind of start making work thinking you're gonna get into festivals, then you're not making work for the right reason. Like you make the work for the work, like the work should speak for itself. It doesn't matter if your film doesn't get into a film festival, like that doesn't matter. What matters is that you've made a film that you're proud of and that says something. So I think it's like, yes, obviously the festivals and the awards and like is a bonus. And I love, um, I love knowing if I've made something good that I feel like deserves an audience. Like I kind of feel now I've got a bit of a sense of where the shorts I've gone should go and which festivals work for them. But it's also like, there's no rules. Everything is just made up every single time. So, you know, there's no expectation about what a film festival would want or what awards would go there. And it's ultimately just a bunch of people on Zoom discussing your film. So like, I think, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's as short filmmakers, it's not helpful to enter the kind of, um, the, the making of the work thinking there's an award. I think if you win an award or your film gets seen, or even if you just like, honestly make a film, like you've done so much work and that's amazing. And that's like, that's the thing that is more important to me is, is like making a piece of work that everyone's proud of than like, honestly, if my only, if my, if my parents just saw it, I'd be delighted. That'd be great. They liked it. They don't like half the things I make. So I'm going to say, are they fans? They like it. They've like done really well. <laughs> They're like the biggest critics. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's good to keep your critics close, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Miriam, how about you? What about this, the Baton nomination and how has that worked in terms of your, your, your uh, short film? And, and was it something you were thinking about or idealising before you started? No, I, I no. I guess I mean I, I I do echo that you know you you never set out to make a film thinking this is going to be the Oscar winner, but I I do completely um, have to say that it does a lot to uh, re I mean reinforce you and boost your confidence and um and 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 give you that encouragement to keep going and to keep making and. Um, the only, I guess, the thing is, I, I, I make, I tend to make films which I, I would say I've, I've kind of always been quite aware of where my audience is. And when you're making short films, your, your audience kind of tends to be, you know, sometimes you just, yeah, it's, you don't want it to just be the festival judges and juries. Like I, I want to, I want to make like my mum wouldn't go to Cannes. Do you know what I mean? I want to make films. She's gonna see and that people in Pakistan would go watch and like so that that it it does become quite um, um it's quite amazing when when the BAFTA nomination it did come through and I thought it's somehow the story I was trying to say and somehow the culture I was talking about um without wanting to like pander to a western audience it translated through and came through and you and it helps you immensely to then get to the next step so it's amazing when it happens, but it's definitely not the the sort of be all of it. Thanks, Miriam. Alice, is that something you would echo? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything that Sarah and Miriam are saying. Um, I also just think, because, you know, of course, everyone, we all want our films to do well and we all want them to get into festivals. and it would be a lie for anyone to say that they wouldn't want a BAFTA, you know, like everyone wants those things, but it's like saying, do you want to win the lottery? Like you can't, you can't plan for those things. Like you just can't, it's like, it's, it's just a doomed way of working. Um, so I'd say aside from that, you know, like it, it, you just, you just have to go from what feel, what you want to make and what you want to talk about and, and fundamentally, I think partly just because it's impossible to plan for, to win an award or it's impossible to plan to get into a, a, a film festival so you literally can't do it but but on the other hand I do think I've definitely noticed that I mean I think it's often a struggle for filmmakers the, the thing of like staying true to yourself versus second guessing what you think other people will want and I think 
I've definitely learned with experience and over time that the second guessing doesn't work like you know that, that actually you have to you have to screen out the sense of what you think other people you know you have to just zone into that thing of like trying to to trust your gut and trying to to be honest and truthful with the stuff that you're making because that makes better work I think it you know even even kind of from a utility you know utilitarian perspective of trying to 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 do well like you will do better if if that's your approach um and you it you can't plan to win an award or to get into a festival so I think yeah you, you just have to go about it that way and then you know often I've I've seen it across my stuff and you know the stuff of my friends of like it's that it's those moments when you 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 really tap into that that you can make really good stuff and then the other thing to say unfortunately is that I do think you know film festivals recognize amazing work but not all amazing work is recognized by festivals and so you know when when stuff doesn't get it like you know I've seen stuff that's objectively amazing that hasn't got into a lot of festivals and I've seen you know I, there, there really is there's just so much work out there and not everything can be recognized and sometimes it's also a you know a kind of uh, like an effect of you know like something will start to get into lots of places and then it will start to get get into more places and and other films just don't pick up in that way and you know you have to just move on and make something else and and not see it as an indictment of your ability to make films and just keep believing in in those abilities I think. Thanks Alice. It's nice if it happens but it's not yeah. definitely not the be all and end all. Um, so we're going to move on to questions from the audience and we've had loads so what we've been doing behind the scenes is trying to filter them so we can cover as much ground as possible in in as few questions as possible so um, sorry if we don't directly answer your specific question but we've, we've tried to capture as many topics and subjects as we can um, and it would be great because we're a little bit short on time I think we can go over maybe by five minutes if also if that's okay with everyone um, we are I, I will just direct the questions to all of you but if one of you could just go for it and answer the question that'd be great so we can get through um, as many as possible so the first question is any advice on how to find the right producer for your short? So does anyone, do any of you want to nominate yourselves to answer that question? Zora, I bet you've got some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I knew the answer. I get a lot of um, amazing projects through and don't get to tell people the answer. I mean, I think, I think if I think about the directors that I've worked with, and maybe that's a helpful way of them thinking about finding me, but like everyone I've ever worked with from when I started out was just my friend and I had no idea how to produce anything. I literally have been making it up since the moment I decided to make short. So, and I still, I think we are constantly learning every time we do a project, like learning about a different type of this or that or way of working or, um, so I think, truly like if you can find someone who wants to make your film even if they're not like an award-winning producer who's done loads of stuff like work with them because ultimately you just need someone who's going to put their heart and soul into your project um I definitely think there's a lot to be said for the BFI network and like um you know especially if you're I think we're very London centric um in terms of like um a lot of the relationships that we we form but like there's a lot of amazing work going on in all the different talent hubs so just reach out to the like network execs at you know film hub north and um southwest film hub and all those different film hubs that are able to do this matchmaking with with people kind of starting out but i mean i think it's like there's a lot of great great producers who are coming up through music videos who are like cutting their teeth hard and fast like making music videos for like the same budgets as short films but with more ferraris and um stunts and fire sequences but for the same amount of money and like there's a lot of great producers there so like go check out who's making music videos and go find out who's like just left NFTS or find out who's kind of hungry to make stuff. But also if you can find one of your friends and convince them to produce something for you, if it's literally your first project ever, then I think that's a good place to start. Like, I don't think you need to have the like perfect short, because that person doesn't, is they're not around for long, you know, like there's no career, unfortunately, I wish there was in being a short film producer um so you just kind of have to find your people and like once you find them grab onto them and hold them and like keep working with them because it's so much nicer to grow with people you know 
but there's no answer there's no easy answer to that question i think it's like there's no well actually i know bumble tried to do a sort of um an app where you could like swipe and find matches for um work people but anyway i don't think that worked also there, there was one we should create that basically yeah. Joe. we should do it <laughs> we are side hustle <laughs> yeah exactly sounds perfect <laughs> Cool. So next question is, do you have any advice for young women doubting their potential or ability in terms of applying to study film or work in the industry in general? Uh, who wants to go for that one? I just Miracle. want to quickly jump in and say, don't doubt yourself ever just because yeah. you're a woman. And that's it. <laughs> that's the end of that's the end of mine. Miriam, do you want to come back on that one? Yeah, um, I guess I, I think there, there'll be plenty of people you know, who do the criticizing and the doubting. So you you kind of can't be that, you know, you have to be the strong one for yourself. Um, it, it, it was a struggle for me, for example, to like convince my parents to let me go study film rather than be a lawyer. Um, but you, I think, yeah, I don't know. I can't really put yourself down without um, trying and giving. And I think you need to have a very resilient core because they, they're, you do come up against a lot of rejection and a lot of doubting and a lot of making mistakes so for that the, finding that strength is really important and protecting it all the way through is really important so I would advise everyone to do that. Brilliant and I think also like Soraha was saying surrounding yourself with people and growing with them is also part of that kind of cocoon that protects you from from the haters I'm sure. Um, okay, next question. What are your favourite short films that you think filmmakers should watch to learn how short film storytelling works? I've got a few. Yeah. Sorry. I'm really talkative today. Um, I think um, Wasp is one of the best short films um, ever made. Um, so I would watch that. Um, I would also watch, there was this, like, I think there's just a lot of really good. Um, films that kind of come out of um, Sundance Film Festival or, um, you know, kind of make it into the Oscars but never win. Um, and there, there was one a couple of years ago called Deck Mental Elemental, which I thought was amazing, which was all about a school shooting. Um, and then I just watched this crazy new short called Dave. Did you guys hear about that? Was it called Dave? David. It was, um, it's going around and I think it's going to do really well. It's got... Um, Will Ferrell in it playing a therapist. Um, so I would check that out. It's not out anywhere, so I don't know how you, anyone's going to do that, but it's really good. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, what else? Oh, and there's a really amazing short film called Fove, which is also really good. And then my other favorite short film is Caroline. So those are, yeah, all one one word shorts. Maybe there's a there's a key in there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I hope you've all been taking notes of, of those titles, but perhaps, um, Soraha, you could write them in the chat or something so that uh, will. You'll make, uh, everyone in the audience can look, go look them up. And, and Gaslan. Gaslan. Um, yeah, put them all in the chat so we can we can track them. Um, Alice, have you got any short films that have inspired you that you think are good to turn to? Don't feel the pressure to answer if you, if you can't. Um. Will. Well, I was going to say what well, I'm going to just second Wasp because it is the best short film ever made. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Right. Next question is for someone with a clear idea of the visual scenes of my first short, but with limited experience of writing dialogue, how can I improve my writing? So, Alice, maybe you want to come. Yeah. And um, I would say if you're interested, like if you want to become a better writer generally rather than find writers to like basically there are several options if you want to be a writer um listen to people talk in the street it's a bit weird but um like just pay attention to the to like voice patterns and like the way that people chat like just listen to your when you're on the bus or whatever um and and I think practice Tists, like just try writing scenes like loosen yourself up don't get maybe don't write them on final draft like write write on um like a notes app or something just hear it in your head maybe say it out loud even um and uh yeah those those uh, those would be the main ones if you don't if you're not if you if it's kind of like a means to an end because actually you don't particularly want to be a writer in the long run 
you can find other writers to work with. So, you know, seek people out that you love their work and try and collaborate with them. Or the final thing I'd say is lean on your actors. Um, that, you know, if you have kind of workable dialogue, but that's not amazing, but that tells the scene, like if you know what your scene needs to do, which is like, which I think you need to understand even as a director, which is kind of like basic dramatic principles of like intention and obstacle and someone's trying to do something and why, you know, what does this person want in the scene and what does this other person want in the scene? Um, if you've got a basis for that, even if the dialogue's a bit functional, then hand it to your actors and let them let them sort of say it in their own words or improvise around it. Or, you know, if that's if if that's something that you don't mind playing with it can be a really great way to to just especially if you're looking for naturalism thanks Alice that's really really helpful um I'm going to end on a closing question that I think is, is quite a nice one to close on um what's the most valuable lesson you've learned in the world of short filmmaking that you'll carry over to your careers in feature film and tv and that you'd like to share with people getting started in their short filmmaking journeys so Miriam let's start with you um, I guess I, I, I used the, um, I used short films to explore what it is I want to say as a filmmaker. And so with each short I made, I tried to hone in closer and closer to, um, you know, that voice or vision, um, that I hold now and I'm feel ready to, I feel really confident with it basically now and to carry it over to features. So perhaps it's with each short you make, you, you know, paying attention to what it is that you're exploring about yourself with this short or about yourself as a filmmaker with this short um, and being mindful of that. Brilliant, thanks Miriam. Alice. Um, I would say that shorts are an opportunity to get things or not just an opportunity they are a place where you will probably get things wrong and make mistakes um and i have found that the shorts that i've made that have been the least kind of successful by my own metric like the ones where i've you know failed in different ways or, or made gotten things wrong have been really painful but unfortunately the places where i really really learn the most and I think the sort of overarching principle I think that I learned from from those experiences is like when to really trust your gut and it's such a, a, a tricky one because so much of filmmaking is has to be compromised because it's like we don't have enough time to film this exactly the way we want to we don't have enough money um but there is at some point a line in the sand and there are things that are uncompromisable or that are um, like the core of what you're doing and that you have to stick to or you have to and, and finding where that line is between healthy compromise and making things work and saying actually this is really important we have to fight for it I think that's a line that it took me a while to find um, and I think shorts is the best place to do it. Okay thanks Alice and Soraha let's end with you. Yeah, I totally echo what um, Alice says there as well. But um, I mean, I think for me, I think I think it doesn't really matter how long um, or short you you your film is in the end. I think it's the fact that you've told a story um, and that you can tell a story, and that's really valuable. I think a lot of people think that once you've done a short, that's it, and you can do a feature. But actually, being a lot of filmmakers come back to shorts later on in their careers, and a lot of filmmakers find that you can. There's actually really there's value and beauty in like short form. So, um, you know, if you can tell a story in five minutes, you can tell a story over five series, you know? And I think that's like a really valuable lesson to not kind of undermine, not undermine, but like undervalue the value of shorts, which is that they are like incredible vehicles to tell small stories or big stories or whatever you want to say. And they're like a really amazing opportunity to use your voice. <laughs>